Thank you very much. And with me now is Debbie Lewis, who's been here through the course of the afternoon. Now, we are going to talk about something that hasn't been brought up this afternoon, but it's very related to science, and it's women in science. We've had many, many experts through the course of the afternoon, and you are one of, I think, two women we've had on panel discussions. So even your story, tell us a little bit about your story, because you actually came to science a little bit later. Um, I did. I was uh, more of a mature student uh, when I first came across the, um, uh, the, the hazard posed by near-Earth objects, um, asteroids, meteors and comets. Um, and, uh, and I went back to education rather late. Uh, I was in my late 30s, early 40s, uh, when I decided to do a master's in risk crisis and disaster, ma uh, in, sorry, risk crisis and disaster management. Um, and I was asked to, to write about something interesting for my dissertation. Um, and I didn't want to write about flu pandemics or floods or that kind of thing. Um, and sure enough, at uh, the UK Space Centre, um, there is a feature on near-Earth objects. And that's where I first uh, discovered them for myself. Uh, raced back to the library. There was one book in the library at the University of Leicester. And then that was my gateway book. And that opened up a whole bibliography for me. Um, so I met some absolutely fascinating people. Some are here today. Uh, some I've, I've had the good fortune to meet over the last sort of 10 years. So I've, I've been very fortunate. Um, and women as, as, as well as men. Um, so yes, there's lots of women, thousands of women. Um, and it's so encouraging to see in the audience just behind you, Lisa. You know, there's so many, you know, young girls um, interested in space, interested in science. So, so yes, don't be like me. Don't, don't, do, you don't have to wait to be old. Um, I wish, you know, I, if I had my time back, I wish that, you know, I had paid much, much more attention. And I'm sorry, I'm just realizing I'm just looking at you, sweetheart, but I should be looking at all of you. Um, you know, pay attention. Maths is so important. I failed maths uh, seven times. So don't be like me. Just, 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 pay attention. Anything you're not sure about, do ask. But, you know, physics is so fascinating. And I wish I'd just been clever enough to do that. So, you know, anything like that, you have a whole vista of subjects, you know, at your disposal. So just grab it and just, you know, take it because this is your opportunity. This is your moment. And then you can join, you know, these wonderful people on the panel and be involved in doing something, you know, absolutely fascinating in relation to the asteroid field. So I, I was absolutely obsessed by it and I was absolutely fascinated by the subject. So, so I hope that, you know, after today you know I'm sure you all are anyway but but yes this is this is your moment and it's just so important you know that you have that opportunity well I have so many more <laughs> questions but I think you couldn't have a better call really? to action <laughs> and of course there are so many females who start off in science it's just about them continuing and not being intimidated to even start later in life oh absolutely There's so many opportunities now and the information is out there and and exactly a chance just for everybody to get involved to get involved in exactly there's no limits no restrictions at all well I mean let me in. <laughs> thank you for your time and you'll welcome. be with us for the course of the afternoon I will indeed yes and now back to Brian So we are here again, ready to look up, and uh, we are trying to connect again with Japan, just to be sure that the connection is alive. And uh, while I see our guest still, I would like to remind you that you can really support Asteroid Day. What is happening here is amazing, and if you would like to celebrate Asteroid Day in such a possibly more useful way, consider supporting Asteroid Day by visiting the website Asteroid Day dot org and we are happy to join again dr seitaro urakawa from the japanese space guard association so welcome back uh, seitaro and uh, i would like to to talk with you about something i find uh, very important to remark i mean you know we have been increasing quite a lot our capability to discover new near-Earth asteroids. And of course, to properly, to, 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 to give value to this, we also need to properly follow up all these objects. Because if you discover something, to lose it again, it is not a good job. And I know that your observatory, Seitaro, is very active in this kind of follow-up activity. And I would like to ask you, how do you organize your typical observing night at your observatory. Hi, Gianluca. I, I'm happy to come back to the asteroid day. So the uh, typical observations, uh, I conduct the follow-up observation uh, uh, for the nearest asteroid, but 
that is a risk to up the minor plant center. Especially the, we target to, to the 20 magnitude asteroid because the, our telescope has a batch size, is a 1.0 meter size. It's a great, uh, larger than the amateur size. So we try to detect the faint object. I understand. And I have seen your observatory many times on the minor planet circular. So I know that at your observatory, this is a very important tradition that is provide follow up of uh, these precious objects. And uh, how many nights in general you observe every year? Because here in Europe, we are facing a very bad year so far, not very clear. And I wonder how things are going there and how often you can observe. Every day. Wow, you are lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so, Seitaro, I was very happy that you could join us bringing your experience, your knowledge and your passion to Asteroid Day Live from Luxembourg. So thanks again. Have a great observing night and see you very soon. And uh, I'm, I'm very pleased now to hand over to Brian. Thank you. We now have a panel called Asteroids Don't Like Borders, which is essentially, I suppose, about the geopolitics of asteroid deflection. And I I'll start with you, Rusty, because it might be surprising to some people that there is such a thing. It seems fairly obvious without thinking too hard. It's like there's an asteroid coming, let's move it. Uh, yeah, uh, I think when most people think that, that is, there's going to be potentially a, a, an impact and let's take care of it, let's, let's, ch let's make that go away, they're thinking of the technical issues. Number one, being able to predict, you know, discover it, predict it's going to hit. Uh, but then in addition to that, deflection, which is also a technical challenge. And indeed, those are the first things that we looked at when we started looking at this overall issue. Uh, the technical uh, early warning process and then deflection when you know that there's something coming. But as we did that, we suddenly realized that any deflection, you, you have to think of a deflection, think of the Earth and a point in the middle somewhere where there will be an impact. And the way in which a deflection is done, it's effectively dragging that impact point across the Earth until it is off the edge, either that way or this way. And so when you think about that, in, it put a real Earth there, not just a, an inanimate globe. <laughs> you have real people and real cities and that kind of thing. And as you're dragging that asteroid off the Earth one way or another, you're dragging it through people's hometown and through their nations. And so the result is any deflection in order to reduce the threat to everybody must temporarily, during that deflection process, increase the risk to people who were not initially at risk. And that, suddenly we realize, is a huge geopolitical challenge to get national leaders and people to accept an exp a huge explosion being dragged through their town on the way off the Earth. But yes. they're going to have to have a vote in that. So this is a big geopolitical issue that we discovered as we were looking at it, at a deflection. Which brings us, Dorian, we, we talked earlier about your work at the UN. So d does that become a, a Security Council issue, a UN-wide issue? Is it a majority vote? You uh, say, well, you know actually, <laughs> actually, at the UN, in the Committee on the Peaceful Uses for Outer Space, the decisions are taken by consensus. So. Rusty just said about geopolitics, moving the point, uh, deflecting the asteroid, and so on. Who takes this decision? NASA, the European Space Agency, or the Russian Space Agency, or the Chinese one? No, we have to have the agreement of all the world. Such way, in the framework of the United Nations, uh, we worked very hard on near-Earth objects. We had a working group on this subject, and uh, we just produced with the help of all participants, of all member states, two institutions. One of them, the International Asteroid Warning Network, which uh, determines the uh, dangerous asteroids, make all measurements, monitor the asteroids, um, try to determine the characteristics, and inform the UN and the member states about the danger some of them pose 
to the humanity. Another institution, the Space Mission Planning Advisory Group, just advised the big space agencies and the government how to build the structure, how to build the technology to move the asteroid from its way, so to deflect the orbit. And all these decisions are to be taken in the very wide framework. This is the UN. And we have the Director General of ESA here, Jan Werner, so thank you for joining us. Um, so expanding on that point, how do the different space agencies, you know, ESA and NASA, Roscosmos and so on, interact with each other? Yeah, I would like to come back to the, uh, to the idea of that there is a specific point where the, where the asteroid might hit. As we know, this specific point is not a specific point. There is some scattering to the, to the right and to the left, so there can be no nation at all saying, it will not hit me. That in the last moment, yes, but if it's early enough, nobody can say it. And this is for me a, an opportunity. So it's uh, not only a challenge, it's an opportunity because nobody knows, so all should care, take care of that. It's similar like climate change. Eh? You can also, climate change is also a global uh, thing. And therefore, I hope that this uh, asteroid impact scenario, which is a very, very realistic one, is not something which is endangering only the Earth, but at the same time bringing some geopolitical coherence between the different member states of, of our globe. And I say member states of our globe because we are all members of the same spacecraft. Uh, and this is for me an opportunity. Uh, and when you ask astronauts when they are in space, they don't see borders, which is already very nice. The asteroid also doesn't see any border. And this gives for me the good feeling now this is a, a topic where we have to work together and if we have to work together, we will work together and if we will work together, then it's good for our Earth. Mm -hmm. So ESA tries always um, to do things like that in an international environment. ESA itself is already 22 member states uh, plus Slovenia plus Canada. So we are, uh, it's our day to day work. And therefore, we are also looking in this field um, to the others, uh, to the Russians, to the Japanese, to the Americans. And the last uh, bigger uh, head of delegation round or head of agency round we had uh, some years ago, I asked all the heads at the same table saying, now, are you really supporting um, this um, uh, planetary defense? Can we work together? And all of them agreed. Uh, so the next time is to have a signature. Some, something like a really uh, something which shows that there is a will behind it. But I, I see the opportunities. It's interesting that planetary defense has to be debated and it's quite a difficult process. It sounds so, I can tell so you obvious. Why. I can tell you why. And when I was discussing it with uh, the member states of ESA, the, the politicians ask me, will it happen during my political term? <laughs> Not even my lifetime. No, <laughs> political <laughs> term. That was, uh, and, and you, see, you cannot say yes or no. You cannot say. You, you can say that there is some probability. And what we have to understand that probability is, is, is a nice word, but risk is a more important one. The difference between probability and risk is probability is just the, the likelihood that something occurs. Mm. But risk multiplies this, the likelihood, yeah. with the damage. And therefore, because in the case of an asteroid, the damage might be really total of the, the old Earth. If the damage is that big, we cannot accept any probability. And this is where we, we have to work and where we have to convince politicians. It's not a, a question of a, a political term. Yes. And Mark, we're in the early stages of this process at the moment at the UN and between the space agencies and governments. Um, how long are we likely to have? If, if, in terms of early warning, um, how long will these agencies have to sort this matter well, out? We all in this business like to quote Don Yeomans, the former director of the Near Earth Object Program Office and one of the founder, founding fathers of planetary defense. And he said there are three rules of planetary defense. Find them early, find them early, find them early. So you really need a long time to implement uh, a deflection campaign, um, which and hasn't even been tested yet. I mean, we think we know how to do it. We think we have the technology. We think we can pull it off, but it has to be tested. Um, and, and even once we do that, it would take years um, to send a mission. A kinetic impactor is probably the most likely um, tool that we would use, uh, an object that runs into the asteroid and either speeds it up a little bit or slows it down a little bit enough to miss the Earth, but then it could take as much of a, as a decade for the, the trajectory to drift away, the, the point in its orbit to drift away from where it otherwise would have been 
if on a collision course. And now Rusty brings up the geopolitical potential problems of temporarily increasing the risk to other places on the planet. That's another reason to find them early. Um, because if people, um, you know, are, are, if they're put at risk on a very short time scale, it means something, but putting people at risk, you know, 50 years away, potential risk, if, if it fails, there's still time to recover. And I think earthlings are nor notorious for not worrying about anything more than a few decades away. And then, or their term of office, if it happened yeah. to be political. Yeah. Yeah. So we're arguing for longer terms in place, surely we're not. So are we? anyway, <laughs> and there's also the problem of what to do if there is if there is an impact yeah. that we don't see, or if there is a, an unavoidable impact, that raises great geopolitical problems. It's a, it's a refugee type problem in a sense, isn't it? Evacuation problem. It is, and it's exactly that. And one of the issues that I get quite um, exercised about, um, and I was reading a magazine article very much on this scenario where people do have to evacuate their own countries, go into another country, so effectively, yes, they're refugees, and, and the option is to put everyone in tents. Now, tents are absolutely fine if you have a no-notice hazard uh, or a disaster situation that's occurring or you have conflict and you have to move people out to a place of safety very quickly, then that's absolutely fine. But if we have a scenario where we have 10 or maybe 20 years preparation time, um, then we have 20 years to do something a little bit more sophisticated, I feel, um, than doing a tented option. Um, and, and also when people think about evacuation, well, where are you going to evacuate people to? I mean, our recent experience has been very much one of sports halls, um, as I say, these tents. Um, in the UK, when we've had people who've been flooded and they're out of their homes, then they've been temporarily rehomed in caravans. And we did a survey through Asteroid Day a couple of years ago when I started to get the results back. Um, and I've sort of tested out some of my harebrained schemes or my sol solutions, which, yes, I do prefer a subterranean solution, I've got to be honest, you know, and I would put people in bunkers and I know that there are perhaps people here who perhaps don't feel as passionately um, about the bunker solution as I do, but I tested this, you see. Um, and specifically the if, if there's an impact that's yes, unavoidable. Uh, exactly, and I sort of said, you know, what, you know, because we do need contingent planning arrangements you know in the unlikely event um, that you know any mitigation attempts either aren't as successful as we would like them to be or they might fail so we do need to plan and of course if we've got 10, 10 or 20 years then we can start to think not just about saving people's lives but it's also about saving people's livelihoods because you've moved people what do you expect people to do when you've put them say underground and it's not just me that wants to put people actually want to go underground they're quite happy with that with that subterranean <laughs> that solution wants to put them underground <laughs> like that sense. well the, the thing is as well with emergency planning contingency planning you don't want to reinvent the wheel so you're just pumping up the tires so we already have things in place um, so you know there are survival shelters in the United States obviously for advertising purposes they're not sponsors yet so I won't mention them um, but they are there um, and we have disused uh, underground nuclear bunkers which you could bring back into in, into use um, appreciate that they might require a little bit more money being spent on them but that's the difficulty and, and we get into this geopolitical field because if you're taking people in um, you know who pays to look after those people so it's all these debates it's all these conversations that really need to be happening now preferably before an asteroid is, is, is discovered to be on a collision course with us yes. but this is why it's so important and this is why I'm just so glad that we can talk about we can talk about this now but we need to encourage other people to carry on this conversation just very quickly it's about 10 seconds though. <laughs> <laughs> well Debbie raises a very interesting issue which is the reality of evacuation in the event of an impact that happens. But the question that's going to face geopolitical leaders before that time is do we spend the money to deflect this or do we let it hit? And there is obviously a size at which you say it's less expensive for the world anyway to let it hit mm -hmm. and evacuate mm -hmm. people than it is to send up a, a, a mission that may cost a billion dollars mm -hmm. 
to deflect we, we it. That's to a find, tough decision. We too. need to find we need more time. To event financing. Yeah, we need to find more time to debate this. Because <laughs> yeah. we're saying essentially, is, is it, could it be that a city, letting a city go, is cheaper than building the mission to deflect the asteroid? Is really? what you're saying. Well, it might be the only option too. If something is found on, you know, final, you know, short warning, there's no, nothing you can nothing do exactly. except exactly. evacuate. Exactly. Someone just shouted no yeah. then when I said no, that. You, it was you, you cannot <laughs> so, early enough decide really where it will hit. This is clear. Yes, it's clear. So this is you if you look for evacuation. I'm as, not it sure. get, as it gets closer uh, and closer, uh, the, the uh, identity uh, of where it's really, if it's inclined, and then it will, <laughs> yeah. it will have from the atmosphere, it will have some, uh, some effect by the atmosphere. Yes. We, so what we know is we have 173 <laughs> confirmed craters on the Earth. And yes. this is what should worry it. So, worry us. so we should really look to avoid that in the future. This by is bi playing billiard in space. With that, it's a great <laughs> soundbite. <laughs> we, we have to go. I'm going to go over to Sabinia. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure it will be likely to continue because it's important to raise all of these questions. But we're now going to raise questions about Asteroid Day and we're going all the way to Kuwait and a warm welcome to Professor Ismail Sabah. Hi. Hi. How how are you? We're fine here. And how are you? Good. What's Very happen good. good. What's happening um, over in Kuwait today on Asteroid Day? Yeah, we ha have a theater for 350 seats, mm -hmm. and we invited every single segment of the society, mm. army, police, high school, universities, and so on. Mm. I will talk in my uh, talk about uh, Big Bang, solar system, formation of the asteroid belt, and the Earth crossing asteroid. Mm. I will also talk about the main asteroid events, like Tunguska in 1908 and Shrivernist in 2013. I also talk about the recent asteroid that exploded over uh, Botswana in South Africa early this month. Mm -hmm. We have also exhibition with uh, 15 uh, booths. And uh, we'll talk about how to avoid asteroid, protect our, our Earth, and, mm -hmm. and so on. Sounds like a very important and educational event, just like we like it at Astro Day. And Professor Sabah, to you and the team, thank you for engaging yourself so much, and the best of luck today. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. And with that, let's go over to Astro Day in Greece, where I think we have Takis Theodoussi with us, Regional Director, Coordinator in Greece. How are you doing? Hello from sunny Athens. Hello from sunny Athens uh, and from sunny you. Luxembourg. Fine. So <laughs> how, how the, I know the activities were really buzzing last year. What's happening this year? Yes, we have two very busy days, today and tomorrow. We are planning and organizing the whole Asteroid Day in Greece in, here in Athens. There are also other events all over Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, but the main uh, point is here in Athens. Today we have had more than 200 uh, children participating in our presentations about asteroids and meteorites. And tomorrow we will have very prominent astronomers and astrophysicians uh, speaking about uh, Homer's Odyssey and Ilias and the natural phenomena that uh, were uh, probably uh, depending on uh, meteorites, comets, other asteroids falling on Earth at the actual times. Uh, I will have also tomorrow my presentation about uh, my research of my team about uh, meteoritic uh, uh, craters in uh, Greece and our findings by the last uh, eight years about. Mm. Wow, it sounds like it's a busy agenda. And once again, thank you and your team for engaging. It's so overwhelming and so positive to hear the responses and all the engagement all across the world for Astro Day. So thank you very much, Takis. Have a lovely day. Thank you, too. Have a lovely day, too. And from hearing from Astro Day, hearing from our experts, I think it's time to hand over to Joseph and the kids in the studio.
Thank you. So we again changed the audience here and I'm uh, back with a class uh, from MAMA, uh, Lisa in MAMA, and uh, with, together with their teachers they had uh, different uh, space activities in school and uh, it was even, they even considered uh, political uh, aspects of uh, the space mining for example, and, uh, but they focused however on uh, a mission uh, around Mars, uh, Mars and they produced a lovely film and so I have uh, Christoph here on my right. Uh, Christoph, uh, why, why did you decide uh, to go to Mars? <laughs> yeah. Um, we took it uh, in um, consideration the space mining of um, Luxembourg and their research with uh, other project of uh, SpaceX like and decided on a Mars space be to give humanity a kind of future outlook and a base to live again. Okay, thank you very much. So, and I, I hope you saw this uh, beautiful uh, Mars station that they printed with a 3D printer. printer. So, uh, but uh, when you thought about this project, uh, Jade, uh, there, there were also you had, there were a lot of problems. No? Yeah, since nobody has done it before, um, we had to inspire ourselves by the moon, moon landing, mm -hmm. and so we had to develop it into the Mars project. And we were into a lot of difficulties for the preparation, and also to we had to search a lot about the Mars itself for it to to have a to search for a cap capability for the species to live on it. So that was that. Thank you very much for all this uh, nice information, and I, I pass over to Lisa. Thank you so much, Joseph. And we're going to take another couple of Skype calls now. And firstly, we're going to meet with Asteroid Day supporter Scott Manley. Hopefully you're there behind us. Hello. And welcome to Asteroid Day Live here in Luxembourg. Where are you, in fact? San Francisco. Well, welcome. What time is it over there for you? That's about 7.20 in the morning. The uh, sun is rising, so... It's a good day looking ahead. It doesn't sound like you're originally from San Francisco, but we're, we're global here at Asteroid Day. Now, tell us about what you do to show us what asteroids might feel like or even look like. Yeah, I do a lot of visualization to let the world know what, uh, you know, asteroids can actually look like. Uh, one of my most popular videos was basically showing uh, what every asteroid looked like in the solar system. So we viewed from a and it showed every asteroid as it was discovered over time. Uh, at the other end of the scale, I've been doing things like 3D printing models of asteroids. This is a globe of Vesta, which is one of the largest asteroids in the main belt. And uh, another one we've got, which is a VR experience. You can view this actually. You basically start on the surface of the Earth, and you can look up and see the stars. But then we turn on the asteroids and you can start to see that the Earth isn't just alone in space. It's surrounded by asteroids zipping by us all the time and some of them are closer than others. And where can people find these virtual reality videos? These are all on my YouTube channel, but uh, it's easy to search for what if you could see all the asteroids. And also you've got some very interesting collaborations going on with sci-fi authors. Uh, I've worked with sci-fi authors and video game creators in the past, but uh, I guess the most famous thing was about 20 years I worked with uh, author Anne McCaffrey on Skies of Pern, and she wanted to draw an asteroid on Pern, and I was one of the scientists that came along to help her. We figured out the orbit, talked about the effects, and some of the calculations I did actually ended up as the computer telling the people what was going on. So yeah, that was a bit 20 New York Times bestseller, but a very rare signed hardback copy. Well, thank you so much for your time from San Francisco. We're now going to say goodbye to that side of the world and move over to another side, back to Europe, and it's Latvia we're now going to. Hello there in Latvia, and where we're meeting the Asteroid Day uh, Regional Coordinator, Carlos Berzens. So you're going to tell us all about meteorites. Hello, we are located in Museum of Meteorites in Riga, Latvia. And we are very glad to participate in this global movement of the Asteroid Day. In fact, we have been participated from its very beginning in 2015, so we are glad to be part of this, really. And uh, now we are kind of looking forward for tomorrow when our main event is going to happen, so we will have some scientific uh, talks, uh, popular scientific talks given by different scientists and of course, we 
we expect the kids uh, as well to attend. In uh, fact, uh, this year we will focus somewhat on the asteroid best, of course, uh, as main attraction. And we do have some meteorites, some head meteorites also from this even, so to be originate in, uh, in uh, some collision like one billion years ago from the Vesta. Well, we also have some, some of course, different uh, meteorites to watch and to talk about their origin. And uh, yes, th that's a really great way for people to really touch the sky. We hope you'll have a very large audience there tonight in Latvia to hear these talks, particularly, of course, the young generation. That's one of our pillars this year. We want to invite more young people to be excited and curious about Asteroid Day. Thank you for your involvement from the very beginning. Have a Thank wonderful you. evening. <laughs> Happy Asteroid Day to you as well. And, of course, if you'd like to donate to Asteroid Day, we need the donations to keep this going. You can find all the details online at ad.org. Of course, get involved with your local astronomy club and within your university as well. There's plenty of asteroid clubs and, and astronomy clubs, of course, through most universities in the world. Now Richard Dawkins and Rusty are going to elaborate with further conversation. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here with Richard Dawkins and I'm very anxious to have this discussion because, Richard, as we began thinking about deflection and the realities of deflection, uh, we realized that there was a situation where effectively you're taking a, an, a place where an asteroid would hit on the Earth and in order to eliminate the risk to everybody, you have to drag that impact point effectively off the Earth. That's what a deflection does. It essentially takes what wasn't the original impact point and drags it across the Earth until it no longer is on the Earth. And that obviously means that people who were not initially at risk from the original point are temporarily put at risk as this process is being done. And that drags it across cities and nation states, etc. So we realized that in some sense, this is a planetary decision, not the decision of any one nation or space agency. And ultimately, to eliminate the risk to everybody, people who weren't at risk have to take a risk now. So the question is then, is there a collective survival instinct that is sufficient to overcome the self-interest of people who are put temporarily at risk in this process? I fear not. I think if you want to find that, you don't look to evolutionary theory. Uh, a collective responsibility, a sensitivity to collective risk, has to come from something beyond ordinary evolution. It has to come from the human brain, which is, has emergent properties, which are obviously have to have evolved by Darwinian processes, but nevertheless are not what we ordinarily expect of Darwinian processes. So there is no Darwinian rationale for a collective will to preserve the whole planet or the whole species, nor is there indeed a collective will to, to look to the distant, f distant future. And one of the problems with this whole discussion is that we are um, not in the scenario you just painted, but more generally, we're concerned with risks to our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, um, not necessarily to ourselves. And that, again, is not something that um, has any place in Darwinian theory. So we have to look to uh, the human brain, to the emergent properties of the human brain, which are unique in the whole of evolution. Well, you know, it's interesting. I can reflect back uh, about 30 years uh, during the confrontation in the Cold War, and I recall a, a very uh, important book called Fate of the Earth, uh, written by Jonathan Shell at the time. And in that book, I can remember my personal reaction when he pointed out the difference that I f would feel, and I certainly did, between my death as an individual and the idea of the collective death of the species. Yes. And it seems to me that, I, I mean, I, f I recognize a very real difference between those two things. And I'm, but you don't feel that no, there I is I mean, that. I, I recognize that, and, and um, I, I think I, 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 the, the, the end of humanity would, to, to me would be a tragedy yeah. over and beyond the end of, the end of, of, of myself. 
And, and so but you're I not willing to take a risk yourself then? Oh, yes. In order to oh, save yes. humanity? Oh, sure, sure I am, yes. Oh. Um, I'm, I'm just saying that it doesn't have an easy Darwinian explanation. It's oh, no, no, I wasn't suggesting Darwinian. No. But then, if not Darwinian, how do we encourage this, this recognition of this conflict, this tension, and come to a place where in the future when a threat really does emerge, there is the acceptance of the idea that we along this direction should accept something for, on the benefit yeah, of everyone. I think great is the power of education and, and, and we, we, do, we do have the power to educate people beyond their Darwinian heritage. Right. And so hence Asteroid Day. Hence Asteroid are. Day, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.